Good afternoon or good morning. Depends upon where you're at. Good night. This is Bill Gustin, the oldest man in the panel, coming to you live from Ricky Stevens Video Studio in the Miami-Dade Training Division. Uh, Captain Stevens is the brains behind our 2022 Miami-Dade Fire Rescue Open uh, Enrollment Recruitment Video. If you haven't seen it, it is total Hollywood glitz, admittedly. Admittedly, it's totally Hollywood glitz, but it is, it's brilliant. It is brilliant, and it's all due to, uh, it's Bricky's brainchild. Um, special guest today is uh, our brother Brett Brooks from Toronto, north of the border, and he, I consider him one of the foremost subject matter experts on high-rise fire protection. It's not just fire fighting. It's got to be fire protection because there's a lot of things to consider other than just tactics and strategy. Uh, we've got Clark Lamping, another high-rise subject matter expert from Clark County, Nevada. And then we got this guy here from uh, formerly from the Atlanta Fire Department. I heard at one time he was a pretty good firefighter uh, and that would be David Rhodes, our, our new editor in chief. And uh, uh, great to have you on board there, David. I know you're being pulled from many different directions. Uh, so we don't expect you to be on long, but um, we will do just fine without your adult supervision. I okay? trust that you will. <laughs> but remember, you are being recorded. Yes, we are. And then at the bottom of the list here, I see our dear friend from the West Coast, the left coast, Daryl Liggins, uh, a what I hear is a pretty good engine company firefighter, a captain, and uh, who is now attached to the training division. Is that correct? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm on the landing strip here at the training division. So thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. Do we got anybody else on board? We're waiting on, we're waiting on Captain Mike Dugan. He may I'm here. I'm here. Oh, there he is. Captain Mike. Yep. I didn't forget you. Uh, I owe you a phone call when we get off here. Uh, call me tomorrow, Bill. I got to go to the dentist right after this. I have to have an implant put well, in. Okay. Now, you know, I told you yesterday when we're on the phone, I drop off my teeth at the dentist like people would drive off, drop off their dry cleaning. Okay. All this shit, that yeah. stuff there. So uh, good to have you on board. And uh, Jimmy Davis is making an appeal. He'll get on from the Chicago Fire Department, Engine Company 43. Before we go any further, let's thank our good friends at Keyhose. That's keyhose.com. I say at every hangout, take the key challenge. Try to kink Keyhose. It works under low pressure conditions with low pressure nozzles. And uh, which is extremely, our uh, topic today is going to be primarily high rise. And um, consider when you got these New York style pencil buildings where they're like well over a thousand feet tall, but each unit is its, each floor is its own unit. Where are you going to lay that hose out? You're not going to have a spacious hallway. You are going to have to have hose that has inherent kink resistance you will get that along with durability with key hose take the key challenge so um i'm going to give the floor to our uh, our special guest brent brooks and uh if he can kind of give us an idea of all of the exciting things that toronto fire has been doing uh recently within the last couple of years uh, which has made that department at the forefront of uh, breaking edge technology when it comes to high rise. Are you on board there, Brother Brett? Absolutely. And okay, uh, go ahead, Ben. A, a, a lot of people don't know this, but we've had a dedicated high rise unit since 1988. 
And uh, we just keep making it better and better. We're on our third generation of high-rise vehicles now, and we actually have two dedicated high-rise trucks. Um, and that's all they do is um, high-rise operations. Now, being a high-rise guy, and, 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 and that's where uh, I spend most of my research, I would actually like to change the name of the truck to um, tactics because we're finding a lot of our high-rise tactics can be used on residential house fires, commercial fires, um, and, and, and so on. Um, another thing we uh, we're trying to push in Toronto is to stop pigeonholing uh, different nozzles, like the floor below nozzle. Uh, we're using those um, not just for its intended purpose for floor below for high rise, but we're using it for residential house fires when we add a rotary distributor to it. Um, our high rise packs, we're not calling them high rise packs anymore. We're calling them hose packs because we can um, uh, deploy that to a roof. We can deploy that to a factory. We're bringing our gate and gauge, even though we don't plan on using the standpipe system. Um, but it takes the onus off the pump operator. So a bunch of different uh, uh, tactics. I was just uh, in Dubai uh, trying to understand how they were able to pump water to 310 meters. Um, and I talked to some engineers there and I know how to get water now to 400 meters. So the future is looking bright um, for the designers and engineers that are building this building. We just have to stay ahead of the game uh, with our tactics um, and be ready for these buildings. Um, Toronto has timber frame construction, high rise buildings. I know the states have the largest uh, right now in the world, but what are our, what is our plan for those type of buildings? And it's uh, reach a stream, it's a volume of water, but what we've also added into it was the ergonomics on hose movements. Um, and, and that's something that um, we're really proud about in, in, uh, in our city. And one more thing we decided to do is we time every single thing we do in Toronto and it's called our A2 time. And what we're finding is it takes longer for us to respond vertically than it does for us to arrive at the building address. So taking that into, into consideration, if we have all our different tactics, you know, sitting at street level on, uh, on, on the ground floor, you might as well respond from the fire hall because it takes us longer to do our vertical response time. So we have to stage all those special tactics, um, two floors below, take an 80-story building, make it a two-story building um, because we just can't afford to get behind the fire because it's going to take us 12 minutes to actually put that tactic into play. So eliminate those 12 minutes, have the uh, tactics uh, pre-deployed and uh, ready two floors below. To your point, <clears throat> our deputy fire chief was a young, sharp guy. I had him as a uh, uh, probationary firefighter. He's worked his way up through the ranks. Um, he's made it clear. There is no what we call level one staging, which would be staying in the apparatus a block uh, away in the dis uh, direction of travel. There is no level one staging on a high rise assignment. There's staging, but it's two floors below the fire. If you are not given a specific order, first three companies are going to the fire, marshalling, assembling, assembling themselves on the floor below the fire. But three companies going up, if you're not given a, an order, you are going to take your air bottles and you're going to ascend. And as soon as we can, it's incumbent upon our fire floor division supervisor to determine that we have enough holes. Quit bringing holes. We don't need holes. We know, <clears throat> if I could. What's that? We okay? Yep. yep. All right. You froze. you froze for a minute, Bill. Well, that's because it's freezing here in Miami, Florida, for God's sake. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Talking to the guys that service our compressors for our scuba gear and uh, our SCBA, they have uh, the contract with uh, resorts in the Caribbean where they run a high pressure rubber line underground from a cascade system on next to a hotel on shore, hundreds of feet to a dock and then hundreds of feet out to the dock and they say they have no problem filling breathing after uh, scuba tanks. Have you guys looked into this? It would almost be like a fire, a poor man's fire system. Not as good as a fire system, but a poor. Have you looked into this at all, Brent? 
Uh, yes, yes, we have. And the problem with that is we have other uh, building code stuff that we need to change and it would be a, a, a building code um, option for us. Um, but right now we got kind of other battles. So it, it, it is low on our burner, but it is certainly uh, crossed our desk. Well, well, we were thinking about bringing it with us. Oh, we'll okay, just that's different. Hoist it up the side of the building. I like that idea. Well, he says it's doable. They do it. They already do it throughout the Caribbean and in the in the Florida Keys. I like it. Is uh, um, Jimmy are you on board, brother? There he is. I don't see him, but if you guys, I, see him, easier. I, can, I can see him. Just he just has no no audio. Uh, Bill, you know when you were talking about uh, so every time we get a high rise fire, we call that second alarm. And, yeah. and, and I'm glad we're on the same page is we want that second alarm response to, to not go to the base sector. We're calling a second alarm because it's a high rise fire. Those crews are coming forward with the equipment and we have three, we have three drop points uh, for our equipment. They have to get there um, because if the fire gets ahead of us, um, there's, uh, you know, there's no um, gaining that time back. So I'm, right. I'm, I'm glad right. I heard you say that. Uh, Jimmy, are you on board? Still working. I, have a, I can see I him. Have a question. I, can hear him. I have a question for him when he comes on board. Okay. I listened to radio traffic from um, the high rise fire they had uh, two weeks ago, Saturday. And um, this is the one that spread. He's going to, he's going to uh, explain it to us and examine it. But what impressed me is how assignments are made based upon their SOP order of arrival based upon their automatic vehicle locator system. So they can tell first chief, still alarm chief, which would be the telephone alarm chief, first in chief, forward fire command chief, search and rescue chief, plans chief, this is all figured out before anybody's even on the scene. The benefit is, I don't know how it is in Toronto, if your chiefs have drivers or aides or adjutants, most of the country doesn't. And we got to get rid of that word driver because we're just shooting ourselves in the feet. That's the least important thing he does. But in terms of driving, Brent, I, I don't want the chief driving them. I want to fixate it on the mobile uh, computer terminal. And um, we've had, a, that has been a topic before, but uh, is, um, I listened to the radio traffic from Chicago and once Jimmy is on, I'm going to ask him because it looked to me like when the first two companies came on board or came on the scene, and said that they had a fire visible from the cab of their app. They weren't even off the apparatus. Bam, immediately they struck an extra alarm and a level one MCI. And that's the kind of proactive. I just read that hashtag. Uh, whoever you are, please contact me because I want to implement this thing. I think, think it's doable. And, uh, you know, we, we're the scuba diving capital of the world. So, We've got an abundance of guys dealing with air compressors and all that here in, um, in the Miami area, the Florida Keys and Bahamas and the Caribbean. Captain Mike, um, we were talking about cockloft fires and I was asking you about your cockloft nozzle. Mm -hmm. We had a fire in a cockloft and, and Mike, it did not go well. Uh, and we've got a learning curve and we are gonna use it as a teachable moment, not a punitive moment, not a disciplined moment. It's just, hey, show me a perfect fire department. I'll show you one that doesn't go to fires. Mike, it just, hey, um, what did John Salka say in our, in our competitor's magazine? or a website, I made a mistake. I made a mistake, okay? Who hasn't made a mistake? Hell, I got married, for God's sake. What more mistake can I make? 
Bill, so, if I had a dollar for every mistake I made in a fire, I'd be living on my own Caribbean island. Yes, okay? yes. Because and, it's a learning curve. You always make mistakes. And yes. that's okay. And I believe there is a God because there wasn't a God. I would have hurt myself and my guys because of my stupid mistakes. So, I, you know, I forgot who said I'd rather be lucky than good. Uh, I forgot who said that. Um, Daryl, how we doing, brother? He, uh, tell me about, because we're reading about it every day, the homeless encampment problem. Not just in your city, but I understand. Where the heck did I just see? Was it Colorado where they had like 175 fires? Are you still experiencing that amount of fires due to the homeless encampments? Yeah, that has still been an, uh, an ongoing issue because I believe 1% of the population is uh, uh Unhoused is the is the term. Unhoused. I don't know why that makes a difference, but uh, that is the term they're using, and there is a still a tremendous amount of of those fires that end up in some in some buildings. Um, I do want to uh, go back to something that you you mentioned, and um, on this call, I definitely go to the least amount of high rise fires than than the rest of you. But we had a pretty sig significant um, one. I would marginally say it was a high rise fire. It was a seven story building and the, the fire was out on the fifth floor. But what you said about the MCI, we had a great battalion chief that when responding, knew, recognized that address, that it was a elderly uh, building. And he called an MCI en route. And that ended up being a terrific move because we had a tremendous amount of people. I wouldn't, there were some rescues, but most were, you know, removals from the building, but it got um, uh, a lot of EMS there, some uh, buses from San Francisco to put people in and it really uh, set a pace. And I think a lot of times we are thinking of the strategy and tactics of the, of the firefight, but um, that was a, a good move. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Captain Mike, um, I listened to the radio traffic from that fire that they had in the Bronx last summer. Twin Peaks, was that? Would that be Twin it? Parks. Twin Parks. Um, I heard distinctly the dispatchers uh, tell the third, fourth, and fifth alarm companies do not bring hose or firefighting equipment. Trucks, report to the command post with your SCED. Engines, report to the command post with your EMS equipment. And I've been... Yeah, Bill, you, you froze again, but that is correct. Teaching and that in department and other departments. Battle it out. And you're going to a, you're going to a medical call. You're not going to a fire. It was a nickel and dime fire. Not that one, where nobody had to die if the doors had been closed. Right, right. And uh, again, that's uh, the issue. It was also a strange building. And a lot of people don't understand that because it's one of those buildings where you go in the main entrance and you go up to the third floor. And you go down the hallways on the third floor and the apartments go in, in and up, or in and down. And then the next hallway is on the sixth floor. And then again, it's the same thing, straight in, in and up, duplex, in and down duplex. And they're supposed to have the stickers on the doors as you crawl through them. Now, we had um, one in our response area when I was captain of 123 called the Rutland Houses. There were five interconnected buildings. They're all interconnected. The, the, the hallway is two blocks long. We used to teach the kids, and you got to know your buildings. We used to teach the probies, you walk in there, if you've got the can, you walk in there with your hook up, even if there's smoke, there's a concrete support column every 25 feet, know where it is, know where the doors are, know how you're getting back out of here. If you pass a stairway door, know where the stairway door is. You got to be ready for those things. This is all about our people being ready for these buildings. I go back to a guy who I loved, 
uh, Mike McNamee from the Worcester Cold Storage Warehouse. And he said, and I'll never forget this. I used to drive by that building going, oh God, I hope I'd ever get a fire in there. And he goes, I wish I drove by that building saying, we got to drill on this building once a month, at least, once a month, at least. It's a building that scares me. We should be in there all the time. Getting all of our people knowledge of this building, what we're doing and how we're doing this. If you have these buildings, you have these high rise, seven story building that Daryl has is a high rise as far as I'm concerned. And again, depending on what your uh, equipment is and everything else and the location, are your trucks going to be able to get in there? What's the construction? And all of this, to me, goes back to the training, training your people to be aware of where they're going. If they are using um, private dwelling, residential fire attack on a high rise, they're crazy. If they're using residential on a commercial, they're crazy. The, the challenge is getting your SOPs, your SOGs to match the building and where we are going to go, what we are doing in this building, bringing the air up, having the air. Now, again, I'm a huge proponent of that fire system that you mentioned, okay? But the thing is, to fight a high-rise fire, you need three things, manpower, water, water and, air. and air. But if you're taking a lot of your manpower to carry up that air, you're already wearing them out. In the first bombing of the World Trade Center, I walked 50 floors. The joke was we left a piece of equipment on every odd floor and spit out on every even floor. Walking up 50 flights, and that was only in the that was in the boots with the three-quarter coats in the boots. We took our boots off and tied them around our neck with a hose strap to get up the <laughs> stairs because it wore you out so much. Okay, you have to have your people ready for this. So you have to have a plan to get what you are going to do for this stuff. Yeah. Um, hey, Cam Gustin. Yes, sir. I want to touch on what uh, Captain Liggins just said a couple minutes ago. Uh, I just read uh, this morning that they had a nine alarm fire in Brockton, Massachusetts. They had an electrical fire in a hospital. And just like Daryl was saying, massive evacuation. Hundred. And this is, I just read, I don't know anything about just what I read in the article. 160 patients evacuated. Um, uh, 70 ambulances called into the scene. Nine alarms. So exactly what Daryl was talking about, you're going to have a lot of people. And in Las Vegas, the majority of the people are going to be non-ambulatory, inebriated, under the influence of legalized marijuana at this point. Um, yeah, it's we have to concentrate more on just putting the fire out and then the repercussions on what happens after. I have yes. 5,000 to 10,000 people in a high-rise building. And, Washington, and D.C. Washington, D.C. No matter where the fire is, they're going to send a company to the basement. Is it conceivable that you could have a fire in the basement and a fire in the electric meter room on the 23rd floor? And the answer is yes. And I strongly suspect that they had an electrical vault and main electrical panel, which shorted out the bus ducts and you had smoke on several floors. And of course they cut off the power and that's what comes on the generator. What a frigging nightmare. It's not the fire, it's a human, humanitarian disaster. So, and, Bill, um, with that, if you're the incident commander or you're somebody in charge of that system, you also have to think about the current conditions. We have been to nursing home fires where we took the people out. Rockton, Massachusetts. I don't know what the temperature was last night there. It was probably about 26 degrees. It was 20 degrees, Cap. 20 degrees. Now you have to get blankets for because they're frail. You could be killing them by leaving them outside in the cold. You have to get these people taken care of. What are you going to do with them? Where are you Where going are you to put them? them? How, How are you are going, you going, going to do this? And, and it just, just you've got to start the troops coming because if you don't have them coming, Clark, you're not playing catch up with all of those people's lives. And if one news reporter sees somebody sitting there shivering saying, get me a blanket, and no fireman is there to help them get a blanket. That's going to be the front page story in the paper. Not that you put the fire out. That's going to be the front page story. And how do you how do you kill? How many people did you kill by shutting off power to a hospital? How many people are on ventilators? How many people are on cardiac uh, monitors? Things like that. You, I, I don't even know. And then they kill the backup generator. 
Oh my gosh. Right. Yeah. Yep. Bill I'm, uh, or Mike, I'm glad you, you mentioned this about people in the cold and that uh, one reason they called the MCI is to get people on buses. You, you could imagine how cold it was out here. It was probably a brisk, like 65, 64 degrees <laughs> in California. Um, no, but in, and as far as putting the fire out, I, you know, I'm thinking of a couple of, of incidents in my career and, um, some of the more challenging ones, the fire wasn't even in the building. It, it's a vehicle or a, a truck or something, or a homeless encampment just pushing a lot of smoke in the building. One was, uh, I mentioned a, in a hangout, I think last year, it was uh, um, two porta potties on the side of a 10 story building that had louvered windows all the way up and it put heavy black smoke on every single floor and so the fire was uh, not a problem at all. Went out with a little uh, booster line, but uh, everything else, uh, you know, we, we even had a, a couple of rescues carrying people down staircases and things. So think about, you know, what you're going to do when you have even these lower floor fires and you have a tremendous amount of, of smoke through throughout. And very honestly, Daryl, uh, you and Clark and me, but Bill also, you also have to think of the converse. It's 110 degrees outside and these people are, you can't leave them in the heat to have heat stroke. You'll kill them faster probably with that than the cold. So you have to think about these things and you have to get, and it's gotta be something that your people are thinking about all the time. And listen, I don't care if you call a second alarm. Uh, one of my jokes is uh, I called the second alarm for a building, it was in the morning, we pulled up and it was fire out the front door, four story building, and the top floor, a window was open and it was heavy, heavy black smoke pushing out of it. And a fire was coming out. I was like, we were having staircase fires and it was burning down buildings and, and I called the second alarm. Well, it turned out it was the recycled materials, all the plastic soda cans and everything in the recycled plastic bin, the rubber made garbage can. And the guy upstairs, had left the door open when he ran into the bathroom to hide. And it was just coming out that thing. We put it out with a two and a half gallon pressurized water extinguisher, but I transmitted a second along. So, I mean, I got rolled like a rented mule. Okay. But you know what? The chief came up to me and said, thank you. He goes, I would have called the second along at the same exact thing. He goes, we can shake hands with these guys. They can break your balls, but I would have done the same thing. So, you know, that's what you got to do. You got to play. You got to be ahead of the game. You got to be proactive. You know, we have our biggest fire problem in, um, in terms of the potential for civilian loss of life in the state of Florida is the non-sprinkler condominium. And it is a synergy. One plus one equals three or four. Old people. You fade out again, pre existing no. meta conditions, disabled or entirely missing self closers. Can you hear me? Yep. You're good, yep. You're good, Mike. Okay. Yep. Self closers, um, they're large, they're high end, they're full of modern petrochemical based materials. Which, when the building was built, that wasn't the case when they were built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and then. We are so dependent upon a standpipe system when in these buildings, they're the most unreliable and those are the ones that we're gonna need the most. So again, it's just the combination of factors. The most that we will ever hope to see is a compromise with the state fire marshal, Florida fire code. And it's called an engineered life safety system, which is a, a grading schedule that you get a certain amount of points for self-closers, uh, division doors in the elevator lobbies. One of them would be run sprinkler branch piping from one standpipe to the next and put a sidewall head inside of each unit and one pendant head on the outside. That's the most we're ever gonna see. Uh, and then, the reliability of these systems. So um, 
we have to be very careful that we don't burst the pipes due to overpressurization. Hey, we're at the half point, and um, I want to bring up our friends again at Keyhose. That's Keyhose.com. I, my department uses the Combat Ready, uh, the inch and three quarters, really 1.88, because it expands in cross sectional area. Okay. But they do have a hose that doesn't expand the frog or none at all. And that would be their true ID hose. Well, you know, it's the M or something like that. You guys take over. I, I have a question for, uh, for, for Brent. So most of the people listening are not part of very large department, certainly not the size of a Toronto FDNY or, or, or even uh, Oakland or, or Vegas. We, we have a majority of the departments are people sitting in three, four station departments with, you know, uh, three members on a rig. So as somebody that spent 16 years in a high rise district and, and uh, on a high rise unit, which is very unique to any, any fire service in the world. What would you have as your top priority for a company, a department arriving with a single engine company, or maybe the second engine company is coming in another seven minutes. There's a lot of things going on in the fire service, uh, you know, setting up, you know, lobby control or all three members going up to operate off of a standpipe. Um, what, what would you say to those organizations that they should really set as their top priority for, for success? Um, it would be smoke control. And we get fooled as firefighters when we get to the building and obviously the lobby's clear, there's a fire on an upper floor and we wedge the lobby doors open, we wreck the building envelope, we start spreading smoke throughout the building, we can't see it. So it's, it's, it's smoke control starts right uh, when, 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 when you first pull up. As we start uh, tunneling our way to the fire, we're opening up compartment to compartment to compartment. We need to control the building's buoyancy, the neutral plane. And if we can control the smoke, we can, we're, we're, we're going to get to the fire, but smoke is what's causing our problems. The more that smoke gets from uh, the, the um, original fire unit into the hallway, into the stairwell, our problem becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and, and, and amplifies. So if you're in a small department and uh, you don't have that backup coming, you need to control the smoke. And you have to do that by understanding the envelope of the building and don't mess it up by wedging it open, chalking it open. Yeah, I remember uh, uh, years ago um, uh, taking a class and in the high rise kits, um, remember the, the, those rubber, we used to cut them out of uh, rubber inner tubes, uh, like a, like a mask and you stretch it over the doorknob. And it, it seems to be something that that's lost where that's a method where you could keep the door from latching closed for later arriving companies, but you're also not chalking it open. There's been so much, uh, focus on chalking. So, uh, yeah. So and, and, like and I'm a fan of the two inch spring clamp because we're not putting the two inch spring clamp on the hinge side that keeps the door open the 90 position. We're putting the two inch spring clamp on the lock side that allow that door to close, but not lock and latch. And it's just a fine, fine opening. So our backup can get to us or, you know, more crews can come, but at least we're maintaining that um, building smoke control because, because high rise buildings are meant to have fires in them. Yeah. And we had a member, time. We had a member come from the Stockton, but, fire department and they use those spring clamps quite a bit and it was really introduced to us and they're fantastic just for everyday uh use on gates and things like that ems calls whenever you don't want that to to latch so that's something for i think should be uh, with any firefighter i think it's just a fan fantastic tool what yeah. about uh hose line size there's still some debate here on on hose line size what have you found, uh, or you guys are using two and a half and, you know, what are your thoughts on some of the other options out there nowadays? Uh, I'm not a big fan of the hybrid uh, new hose packages where you go to a two inch lead length because in, in, in high rise firefighting, if you go to a hybrid hose and nozzle package, your, your tunnel vision is basically from the standpipe system to that fire unit. But as soon as that standpipe system goes down and you have to do an improvised standpipe, 
and you went with a hybrid hose length, you just lost five stories worth of improvised standpipe. So in our city, we know we can pump water to 30 stories. We get six lengths always to the fire floor or, or the staging, because if that building system fails, we're looking at the big picture here, um, we can pump water to 30 stories. And if we, if we have to, um, you know, let's say we were unsuccessful with an inch and three quarter line, what does that next line look like bringing it up? What are the conditions in the building? How much time have we lost? What's our vertical response time? You just can't play catch up. So we're going in, you know, with a big line every single time. And if that fails, so plan A is the building's fire pump. Plan B is uh, us pumping the FDC. Plan C is us pumping into the ground floor standpipe. If that will accept it. And if not, our crews with six lengths of two and a half have eight improvised standpipes that they can do immediately, not having to call new equipment. So we have to look at the big picture for high rise. And if it's that building fails, we're, uh, we're, we're ready up to 30 stories right now. I got a question. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Let's say you have a curtain wall building. It's going to be difficult to support this vertically suspended hose line behind couplings at regular intervals. Now we've done tests, Clark has done tests from the roof of a 25 story building where we, um, we supported only the uppermost suspended coupling. So the weight of that entire vertical stretch was on, uh, now we were using key hose, shameless plug. It was key hose. Yep. It was key hose, it was key hose. It was. And, uh, I have also talked to Dennis Laguerre about this. And um, theoretically, you could go 40 stories. I understand this, this is just um, speculation. FDNY has been looking at this and they have gone am amazing vertical heights, but I don't know at what points they were. Um, uh, supporting this stretch uh, at intervals. When I've done it, it's just been the uppermost coupling. I know, Clark, we can do it from a 25-story building. Brent, sounds to me like you can, you have experience with 30-story uh, buildings doing this, lowering uh, we, hose. Yeah, yeah, um, um, we do. And, and I asked the hose and nozzle manufacturers out there, like, where, where will that breaking, like, when will that coupling um, not be able to support it. Um, no one's been able to give me the proper answer. They, they just say that that hose will tear, um, you know, prior to that coupling failing. So they're not worried about the coupling fail. It would be the actual hose tearing and, and no one can give me that number. Um, when we do an elevated stretch, if we reach out on a balcony and pull a loop in and just put that weight um, now on the balcony, we can get another 30 stories. Yeah, yeah. If we have to do a closed wall stretch, and I know it's going to blow your mind, but we'll stretch four inch hose. Um, if a closed wall stretch, if we if we do our two and a half, we can't get thirty stories anymore. We can only get eleven stories. But if we stretch our four inch hose, and in our department, it's only fifty foot uh, uh, sections, not a hundred foot for our four inch. Uh, we can get back up to the thirtieth floor um, um, hydraulically, and we have it's a your four inch. inch have threaded couplings? No, stores. Stores okay. connections. And have you, because I, I would gonna think that would have to be more vulnerable than your regular expansion ring. Yeah, so that, so, so they, uh, four inch, we're actually not hanging it. We're um, wrapping the stairwell. Uh, we call it a closed okay. wall stretch. Um, okay. If you don't have the ability to do it um, down a well hole uh, or the exterior, we'll do, we can do the four inch as a closed wall stretch. So we don't need to tie it off. It's just, it's just going up the uh, yeah. other part of the stairwell. Hey Brent, you had, a, you had a chart you had showed before we started this hangout that kind of showed uh, what your companies, can, can you describe what we're looking at there? Uh, this is our playbook for uh, high rise. And what's consistent is it's the same hose and nozzle package. So it's two and a half inch, it's a standpipe kit. And if we need a tactics change, we simply replace what's on the tip. And that's why we didn't go with that hybrid uh, hybrid hose length. And then for the incident commander, we took uh, reach a stream uh, for all our devices on our job. So we know for a exterior tack, uh, what we can do in our 230 foot tower, we know it's reach a stream. And then if you notice, I put the floor below nozzle 
uh, at the very top. So after 35 stories, um, you know, we need to use the building systems to fight a exterior fire from the interior. Um, but without, you know, these little cheat sheets um, in our, in, you know, in, in the chief's car or the command vehicle, you can get overwhelmed sometimes. So I think it's, it, we have to look at the big picture in, in firefighting when things go bad, what does that next scenario look like? And, and we believe it's simply changing what's on the tip. The big line's already down. We have a weapon now for all types of fires, but now we can add a, you know, Ram XD. So we can put, I was going to say 2000 liters per minute, but we're in Canada. So we can put 500 gallons per minute, but we didn't have to lay a new hose line to do it. That tactic can immediately go into play because that, that type of equipment is pre-staged two floors below. The floor below, the rotary distributors, the opposing tip nozzle, our breaching uh, nozzles, our piercing nozzles, they're, they're all there and they all work with the same hose and nozzle package. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. One point of concern I've uh, had with the uh, reduction to a residential size line and and i think we could all attest sometimes it's not very apparent from the street if it's residential or commercial and a lot of these residential buildings have tremendous uh uh spaces uh fdny had the fire in the trump tower those are you know these places are the size of houses it these penthouses and still may require a larger line um some of the residential buildings have commercial spaces gyms and kitchens, libraries, things of that nature within the building. So that's a uh, uh, residential mindset doesn't always play out. But if the standpipe system does fail and you do wanna turn that attack line into an improvised standpipe or use it for a monitor, you, you've already went in with, with your hose line that you can adapt from a hose line to a standpipe or to supply a, a monitor or something of that nature, it sounds like. If somebody wants to get a hold of that, is there a way that they could contact you or do you um, share it, information? It, it, it or should be all, all on my website, just highrisefirefighting.com. It's all free, help yourself, PDFs, uh, reach out to me, just highrisefirefighting.com. And um, yeah, we can, we, can, we can share all this information, absolutely. Hey Brent, real quick, hey, our um, friend Mike Sabo, from uh, Florida, he wanted to know what pressure are you pumping that four inch and what's the testing pressure of that four inch going up the stairwell? Uh, I don't know yet. Uh, we're still trying to figure it out. So I have, a, I have another diagram and what we've done is we've taken all our improvised standpipes. So the exterior, the well hole, the closed well, and we've done the hydraulics for two and a half and four inch. Um, so that's, that's what we're trying to uh, fact check uh, peer evaluate, uh, but it's in draft right now. So as soon as that's ready to go, um, obviously we're, I'm going to share, sh share it with you guys, but it's pretty exciting stuff because it does paint the big picture when plan A, B, C, and I think we have up to plan F um, for these high rise now, but it's certainly about getting water. And when I was in Dubai, um, I, I, I went and I toured the building where they were able to pump 310 meters. So that's around uh, 79 stories, I think. Um, but we know now that we can pump 400 meters. So we're into that hundred foot mark with four inch, uh, which four inch hose. However, we have to switch the calves um, in order to do it, but at least we can get some type of agent uh, up top. And it's not your traditional calves. It's, it's a drier foam um, that we can pump to that 400 meters. But uh, Germany uh, is, is, is working on something like that. And, and there's a, there was also a fire in Poland where they use the crane, the high rise crane to do an improvised standpipe and they use three inch line. Um, so I'm, I'm waiting for some video and some pictures from that, but it just shows that, you, you know, it, this is, this, this is a world problem and there's like-minded firefighters all over the world, just like us. And we're just getting better and better at solving the solution. You know, that would be this. Uh, I do not have COVID. I, I, at least I don't think I do. <laughs> Jimmy. Hey, hey, everyone. Hi. Engine 117. Okay, Jimmy, we've got better part of 15 minutes. And there's, Peter, there's no hard and fast stop, is there? <laughs> so, Jimmy, you take it from here. And, um, no, you wanted to examine a fire that you had last week? 
Yeah, Kip, I'll, I'll jump, uh, jump in on this. Hello, everyone. Sorry for the, you know, getting in here a little bit late uh, due to technical issues. Uh, but I'm sure everyone had, had saw the fire that occurred. It was the 23rd of January where we had that high-rise fire. Uh, most notably, the uh, auto exposure and the fire lapping problem uh, that occurred to that building. But the first thing I want to, you know, before I say anything here on that building, I do want to uh, notice the valiant effort made by the firemen, uh, the, the, the women and, and men of the Chicago Fire Department. What you saw was a glance of what's happening on the outside. Yeah, a burning exterior, but the amount of effort that went into play inside that you don't see of having to be able to relocate people from smoky halls, getting them to uh, uh, areas of refuge, getting them into areas where they're safe. You don't see that part. So kudos to them. Um, if you look at the video, and I know we have that, uh, Pete, if you want to look at that, just give them a premiere if, for those that are listening and haven't seen this fire yet, kind of what we're dealing with with the, the auto exposure. And there's a couple points that we can examine that we learned from this. And, uh, you know, there will be some good takeaways, uh, typical and atypical fires. And I, I call them, this one started out uh, with engine 45 in the truck. Um, here we go. Let's, let, let's play that there. Now, this looks like about four or five stories on, a, on an auto exposure. This started, originated in the uh, 15th floor. All right, really short video, 15th floor um, of this building. Obviously, it traveled up upwards and went all the way up uh, just one floor below uh, the roof line there. But again, there was a lot of variables at play. This is typical and atypical fires if we look at these. And everyone can hear me here, right? Yeah, here's another one uh, that gives really good discussion about uh, your protect in place strategy. Do you think the person inside that unit is gonna be sticking around? It's probably one of the first videos that I've seen uh, where actual fires creeping up up the exterior skin of this building and that. So uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But let's talk about technical and, and uh, I'm sorry, the typical and atypical fire. So 45 in the truck, uh, you know, when I talk to him, he said, Jimmy, this is a fire that we do all the time, you know, uh, in, in and out job uh, for them. Now, here's another, another one here. And this looks like when it started from 15 and auto exposed to the 16th floor. So what turned out to be a very typical fire by the time you had the reflex time and getting the people up to the floors above, then it becomes an atypical fire uh, where the fire is out of the box. It's out of its container. It's running the skin of the building. So the first thing I want to talk about, these are those pre-ordinance buildings. I don't know, Cap, if you talked about it before the show, you have pre-ordinance or pre-quote uh, buildings that are just predisposed uh, in some, how, some fashion, in some way um, to be a defective building. And we call these in our jurisdiction and, and everyone has them, you know, we call pre-1975 buildings. You don't know that you have a problem until you have a problem. This became a problem when you had a problem with fire lapping out of that. So we talk about what caused this fire to expose? Uh, we do know this, that that was uh, a highly combustible exterior cladding or spandrel wall, which was basically polystyrofoam. Um, that was inside the building to allow it to uh, uh, readily achieve great heights on the outside of this building. Um, this was, beyond, all right, the capabilities of our suppressional units or your internal suppression, suppression, uh, it outran us basically. So when you have the fire out running you and you know that uh, internal methods are not uh, working, that's why we picked this top. What are some of our options to fight this and apply external water? Um, you probably did discuss some of that, but I, I did take a couple notes down and I think these are key points for the listeners here. Just know that pre-ordinance or grandfather buildings are predisposed, and we talked about that, to defects, all right? It is what it is at that point in time. Um, and again, the problem recognition 
You won't know till the fire, but the best way you can arm yourself is knowing your buildings the best that you can. Also having the mindset in older buildings is that anything's on the table. Anything can go. Anything can happen. These need to be incorporated. Put them in your plan. Uh, I think, Brett, you were talking about that, having a plan B, a plan C, to the D, to the E, uh, whatever it takes. But on older buildings, I think you're going to have to really assume for the worst. All right. This was a typical fire. All right. And we saw some of that video. And uh, I think your best approach, again, is, is knowing the presumption and the likelihood of some type of, of failure uh, or breach of the container. And this is what it was. Just think about if this fire never got outside of the window. You know, that would have been a one-room fire. That's what they were talking about. This is an easy stretch. Jim, we know our buildings. This is easy. So they got in, made their push, extinguished that, that 15-floor bedroom fire. But you know what? It's out of the box right now. Here's an interesting point, and that fire wasn't blowing out of the window when they arrived. So you have to talk your, your primary reflex time. The time you step foot into this building, time you start taking the elevators, locate and find the unit on fire, it's biting up time. So a fire that was kept in its container is now out of the container. Therein lies the concern. Uh, and I think that the Grenfell, uh, and I always looked at that, and I, I make inference to that Grenfell fire, too. Um, that really put these uh, combustible exterior cladding fires really on the map, because before, you, we really never had a plan for that or a plan for that day. Fast forward today, we do have a couple different options we can use. Uh, but one of the, my biggest concerns is, you know, it, you want to keep within that typical fire range, keeping the fire within the, the boundaries of the box. Once it escapes that window, again, all bets are off. And what's interesting, we don't have any hard data right now. It says, well, when does a, a, a window fail at a high rise fire? We don't know, but it could be within that gap of your primary reflex time for the time you open up and the time you start getting up the stairway, the dynamics, the fire has changed substantially. That's why it's important too. And I, I remember trying to keep things in the container. Just think about doors that are open. Many fires we've heard about that getting into the common hallway. Remember Chief Tracy has always said that you're walking into a loaded shotgun. Uh, so we want the container to stay uh, compact, but there is no hard data. Uh, window openings or failure of window entertains a whole host of problems right with the with the wind driven fires uh, especially at that height you know especially knowing you know by definition we can consider a wind driven fire of a wind coming in at 10 miles an hour just think how that's going to impact your um, your operations um, and, and also you know having outside eyes on the fire too would have been a big help as well because think about where we put our lobby command and we put all our, our, our resources inside the belly of this high rise fire, but we need somebody keeping an eye in the exterior, you know, saying, hey, 45, it's out of the box. You got a second floor on fire, all right? That entirely changes dynamics. A two line lead off of a stand pipe requires personnel and people. Uh, you got to keep the resources in. So there were starts and stops throughout this entire incident, a reflex. Getting the holes and equipment, getting the personnel there, bog time. Same bog time, getting people in place, and then they had bog time. So there was like, within the primary, there was like several different reflexes to get the, uh, the people, because this was almost, if you look at it, nine different fires going on in the same building. Well, each floor being, uh, being itself. A couple of things that, you know, what I had learned in um, examining this fire is that a couple key points here is that even with a riser or standpipe, there are limitations to a riser, all right? Risers are not designed, if we're going to do the interior firefight, to having multiple two and a half inch lines off with inch and a quarter orifice, all right? They're not designed for those types of flows. And ran into a, a, a jam in there, but we were able to, to rectify uh, that. 
You got to have a contingency and a plan B for these things, especially if the wind, if they had fires out of the container, breached the window running up the side of the building. What is our plan? What is the plan C? Brett, you may have talked about some of those. And I, I, I wrote down a little bit of list if I'm redundant. Um, but, you know, again, it only further reinforces what I wanted to say. In an incident like this with multiple floors on fire, guess what is really hampered is communications, right? Nine different fires, nine different floors, a, a lot of radio traffic funneling up and then funneling it down. Uh, I think the recommendation, if you are using or having an incident, that it's having multiple floors that you you set up some type of, uh, uh, as I call it, like a division supervisor or somebody designated to that floor. Face-to-face um, -face communication is always good between company officers, firemen, or whatever the needs, your can, conditions, your actions, and need to be given to that, that supervisor so he can relay it downstairs to lobby control instead of everyone independently calling downstairs to lobby to go through one person on each floor. Uh, something that that is very applicable to that uh, uh, when you're dealing with communications. That, that radio gets so bogged down and, and, and clogged up. Um, but that one thing to keep in the back of your mind, kind of maybe isolate each floor. And get your resources up there is the next point. Get them up there as fast as possible, as humanly possible. We use elevators for speed get the manpower, get the equipment, get the provisions that you have in your deeper progressions in those elevators so they're up there. All right, get them going there. Jimmy, I, I got a question for you. Yeah, go ahead. Kim. You and I have discussed this. I was very impressed with your fire alarm office dispatchers. Very impressed. Um, my question to you is, uh, engine 45, truck 15 arrived. Mm -hmm. They gave an indication of a fire. They, they had, I'm going to guess they weren't even out of the cab when the fire alarm office struck a spilling box in a level MCI. Is that automatic when you see a indication of a fire? Is that an automatic or was that requested? Yeah, I, it sounded to me like it was automatic. Yeah, Cap, when that happens, anytime uh, there's a fire in a high rise building and you are going to work off a standpipe system eternally inside the gut of the building, that's an automatic box. You, you pull a second line off the riser or you uh, from a different riser or the same riser, whatever it is, then it becomes a 211 because you're just expanding the entire scope and, and changing the entire landscape of this incident, too. Two lines is uh, that's a big deal. And just think of how many lines that we used. Two light fire in a high rise is a big deal, you know. Um, We've got a guy yeah, here that, with that us. automatic. Yeah, Cap, that automatically happens, and I, I, I wanted to also, uh, you know, mention um, having some type of exterior resource chief outside who's keeping eyes of what's happening on the outside to monitor the fire lapping, the leapfrogging from floor to floor, and radioing uh, that back into the lobby command as well. You got to have eyes on there. And I would also say, what is my time duration before one floor exposes the other? Am I looking at 10 minutes? Am I looking at five? What are my time parameters to start setting up those contingencies? These are a couple things that we can have and we have at our disposal. Uh, we call it the distributor nozzle, you know, dropping it down a floor, uh, two floors above, going in and stopping this fire. Now, it looked worse than it was from the outside than it was from the inside. But you still have smoke in this building. Smoke continues to permeate this entire building, again, moving all those occupants. You had a very heavy populated, densely populated building at the time of the fire, as I had mentioned earlier. So we did simultaneously fire suppression and taking care of the op uh, occupants were strategic goals. I think they did a great job at that. Um, Can you run those videos of the uh, operating with the Bresnan distributor, rotating yeah, distributor? Cards, Bill? Yes. Yeah, stand by a minute. Jimmy, a couple yep. of questions for you. Do you, know ahead, what kind of, go, do you know what kind of siding it was? Yeah, that was a, a apparently uh, what was conveyed again was some type of aluminum um, 
a thinner skin uh, with polystyrofoam. Um, by all means, identify it as a, you know, a combustible exterior. Uh, I haven't seen it. Okay. Uh, but it I was. Have, I don't know if you can see this one here. Yeah, and I can see that with the air. Yeah. That, with the air pockets in it. But what with happens is you can see right through this. I can get light through this. Okay. This creates, you can see through it. If I hold it right, you can see the light by my face there. You can see the light shining through this. This creates its own air void. So one of the things yeah. I was talking to somebody about is maybe when the first engine gets on the first floor and they get outside, sticking the nozzle out the window and up to get it into so that air, that void that's carrying it up, carries it up on the outside. Just something to think about because there are different types. There are different types with this one is a solid one. It's got a black, okay? This one is another one with a different one. They have different fire ratings. This has white in beside. These are different exterior sheathings. And they all burn at some point. It depends on how good they spend their money. Exactly. And Cap, we have these buildings and everyone has this in their backyards. Absolutely. You know, it's really hard to, to point out and identify that. And again, till, till something happens. Uh, today, do you see that? No. But back then, uh, they're pretty prevalent. Yep. Uh, we've got here is a view from the inside of a Bresden distributor. And for those of us um, that have been through hurricanes, it's like sticking your face in wind-driven water, to quote my friend um, Jason Jones. So if you could run the next one, Peter. Okay, he's, what he's explaining there is how we're going to do this. And that is our good friend, Jason Jones. He is a captain with the Cobb County Fire Department. And he and Clark are teaching at a conference where we're actually going to use a distributor. Now, very important point. They did not have a real Bresnan distributor. So we were forced to use ones that had little fog nozzles on them. Mm -hmm. Not not a good idea. That thing would clog in a New York skinny minute. So we're mm. explaining the reducer here, or the increaser, I should say. Can we fast forward that, uh, Peter? Yeah, fast forward until the hose fast goes over that, up. Peter, yeah, there you go. Keep going. Keep going. Good idea, Clark. Jason Keep Jones going. talks way too much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't rob a bank with Clark. He'll give you up in a heartbeat. All right, I think we're good to go now. Okay, we're dangling, and it's very easy to do. We're dangling the hose over the side of the building. When you say, well, wouldn't the fire burn your hose? That's the whole point. It's a wind-driven fire. The fire doesn't want to come out the window. It wants to stay in the building. Uh, I would say one thing here. If, if uh, companies want to do this, uh, try it most uh departments distributor nozzle including ours is just like uh rarely if never used um a lot of them are, are made of brass and dent easily i've done drills where it wouldn't connect to the hose because it's just uh even hasn't been drilled on for a while but one thing i noticed in the video is they were using a two and a half bale to operate it some of these are such high volumes of water, you'd want to use a gate valve rather than a one and three eighths waterway of a, of a two and a half to inch and a half shutoff. And a gate valve would be a solid two and a half waterway. Yes. Um, okay, let's kill that one, Peter. We have one more. Okay, it's a vortex. And I can tell you something else. It's bling. When I go out at night, I wear this around my neck for <laughs> bling. And bling. you know why, Jimmy? Because chicks dig it. <laughs> hey, oh, good. we barely scratched the surface 
Let's do this again with Brent next week or next month. I am going to have a hardwired internet because uh, I'm at headquarters and, and we can buy four $11 million helicopters, but we have a lousy <laughs> wireless internet. So, um, hey, guys, I just say uh, one thing. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, just do me all of all of you do me a favor and remember this stuff, this high rise buildings, they happen. Uh, we are coming up on the is it the 30th anniversary. Yeah, it is later this month, February 26. Okay, 1993, the first bomb in the World Trade Center. When they <clears throat> when they set off that bomb in the basement level, the smoke detectors went off on the 110th floor less than five minutes later. That smoke movement moves because it was February. It was 28, 30 degrees outside, something like that, and 73 degrees in the building. As Brent was talking about before, when we're changing that building, we're opening up the doors, we're moving that cold air, okay? it A lot of times it goes up when it's cold, but if you're in uh, Las Vegas, you're in Oakland, you're in Miami in the winter, I mean, in the summer, that smoke's going down at us. The floor below isn't the place where we're going to be able to make our things. So think about these things when you do this. Think about these things. You have to be aware of everything. Guys, as I said, we just scratched the surface. I want to thank Key, our friends at Key. Oh, also, I'll have my voice back. Um, or I'll have a uh, mannequin here that'll do my talking for me. Um, so, but take the key challenge. Uh, I want to give a shout out to my buddies at key Mark light Hill. And, um, then his name escapes me right now. <laughs> Jesus Christ. When you, but you know, I'm pulling Dave Hibben, Dave Hibben. Hey, listen, I pulled the old guy card. If I forget something. I just blame it on old age, okay? So Dave Hibben from DC Engine 10, okay? So thank you guys. Hey, Brent, are you still with us, brother? I am. I'm still with you, yeah. Can we do it again next month? Absolutely. And uh, I got video and pictures of us actually deploying the Bresden off a roof for an exterior cladding fire, and we ended up lowering it five stories. And it, All it, right, it, man. It, we nailed we got it. a whole month to prepare for this. So let's do this again next month. We just barely scratched the surface. And um, Peter, the man behind the curtain, um, this is an exciting time to be a firefighter. And it's an exciting time to be a student of the fire service. And I don't see any kids in this panel. I mean, I'm the oldest one. But there's no kids here, but every one of us is a consummate student of the fire service that is still learning and learning from our mistakes. So until next month, God bless everybody and may he keep you safe.